and as well. So the first part it says discuss with reasons the correct subsequent measurement and derecognition of property A harmonious in the financial records of Honey Jew Limited for the year ended 30 June 2023. Your discussion should also address the tax implications. And then B, disclose the property plan and equipment not. All right. To the financial statements of Honey Jew Limited for the year ended 30 June 2020, relating to owned assets only in accordance with I 16 paragraph 73D and E. C. Discuss with the reasons whether all the cost that Honey Jew incurred relating to the product Honey Corp can be recognized as intangible asset in terms of IS 38 intangible asset as at 30 June 2023. Assume that the total cost incurred relating to product Honey Corp could not be capitalized as intangible asset in terms of IS 38. Disclose the note of intangible asset to the statement of of Honey Geo Limited for the year ended 30 June 2023. The total column and comparative are not required. Right, and then the last part, prepare the journal entries to account for the lease agreement between Honey Geo Limited and Lease Me Limited in the financial records of Honey Geo Limited for the year ended 30 June 2023. Right, and then you calculate the value of the following to be disclosed separately in the financial records of Honey Jew Limited for the year ended 30 June 2023. Lease accrual expense, termination benefit expense. Please note round off for amounts to the nearest land. Your ads must comply with IFRS. All right, so let's just, I think the best way, let's break it um, into different components. So we answer as we go. All right, so the first part, to want us to discuss with the reasons, subsequent record. Um, I want to discuss subsequent uh, measurement and de recognition of property A and uh, Hermanus. So let's quickly look at it. What's happening with property Hermanus and the records of Honey June? All right. So Honey J Limited is, a, is in the honey industry and is situated in the Western Cape province. The company also develops and produces various products with honey as the main ingredients. The company applies international financial reporting standards with the preparation of its annual financial statement. You are a chartered accountant assisting Honey Jew with the finalization of its 30 June 2023 financial statement. Honey Jew consists of three cash generating units as defined in IS 38, R36, and payment of assets. A honey production CGU, a product development CGU, and a product production CGU. Accounting policy. The following is an excerpt of honey Geo accounting policy. Property planned and equipment accounted for according to the cost model in terms of high 16 property planned and equipment, except for land, which is accounted for according to the revaluation model in terms of high 16. Revaluation surplus are transferred to retained earnings when the land is disposed of factory buildings. And machinery are depreciated according to straight line method over the asset's useful life after consider of any residual value. Land is not depreciation. Land, including land on which flexible building has been built, is classified as a separate class of property, plan, and equipment. Intangible asset are accounted for according to the cost model in terms of IS3 intangible asset. Amortization of intangible assets is calculated based on units of. So there's a percentage of total estimated units. Honey production, CGU. Honey Jew places and maintains many of beehives. A man-made structure to house a honey bee nest on farms in the Keres Valley, situated in the Western Cape province. Keres Valley is an exceptional fertile valley, renowned for its fruit industry. The fruit tree farmers in the Keres Valley benefit from the bees pollinating their fruit trees and honeydew benefiting from the honey, which is retrieved from its beehives. Honeydew does not own any of the farms in the Keris Valley on which it places its beehives. Honeydew also owns vacant land near Amara's property A, where it also places and maintains its beehives. 
the area is popular for its bumbles, allowing it the most sophisticated test to the honey which the bees produce there. Property A. Property A was acquired on 1st of January 2017 at a cost of 4400000 which also forms the best cost of the asset for which capital gains tax purposes. After initial measurement, honey due revalued the land on the following debts. Due to nearby lifestyle estate, country estate development, Honeyju decided to sell property A and acquire farmland in the Hamlin and their valley further away from the hustle and bustle of the developing areas, but still in farm boss. Right, property A was transferred, sold on 30 June 2023 at an amount of 4.5, which was awesome the fair value of the property on this debt. Right, so in terms of um, in terms of this, uh, we can see now, the question now, it says discuss the, discuss the subsequent measurement, right, with regards to, uh, to this property. Discuss with the reason, the correct subsequent measurement and the recognition of property A, right? The financial record of honey due for the year ended 30 June. 2023. Right. So in terms of this, right, we can all see now that um property A, all right, um the company um decided due to nearby lifestyle, all right? Um Honeyju decided they decided to sell property A and to acquire farmland, all right, uh, in this regard. And then property A was transferred or sold on 30 June at an amount of 4500000 which was also the fair value of the property. All right. So with regards to this now, initially, as we all saw, initially the property was sitting as property plan and equipment. Remember, it was owner-occupied. So initially... All right. So initially now was owner occupied, right? Meaning it was property planted equipment, right? But subsequently, that's what we are looking at, right? So initially we had our property that was sitting uh, in our books, um, we're using the property now as property planning and equipment. But subsequently now, uh, they decided to sell this property. Right, which means now the property now had to be classified as non-current asset held for sale, which classified under the first five. Right, so it is important for us to do the correct classification. Right? So the question, is so saying discuss, all right? They want you to discuss the classification, discuss the correct subsequent measurement. They want us to discuss the measurement and the recognition of property A, all right? So in terms of this, remember now, we mentioned now that this property is now going to be classified as and kind of that city. So can you guys open your IFRIS, um, your, your books to IFRIS 5? Non current assets or for sale. I don't know if you guys are able to, to do that. Are you guys there? Not yet. If it's five, all right, I want you to open if it's five, all right, so roughly around paragraph 15. So if it's five, you find it on your books, you find it in part A1, I believe that's the book that you need, that's where you find if it's five. So you guys will let me know where you get there, right? 
I'm there. All right. Just wait. Maybe one minute for us. Yes, I got it. You got it as well. All right. Is everyone there, guys? Yes, I'm there. Okay. Perfect. So we are on interface five. All right. I just want to look for another paragraph as well. In I sixteen, which talks about transfer to non-current assets held for sale, so that um, I guide you guys in that regard. All right. All right. So in terms of subsequent measurement, right, there are things that I want you guys to note right, with regards to, to this question. There is 12 marks, all right? Um, in regards to this, all right, um, they want us to look at subsequent measurement. So if you check your books, all right, if you look at your books, there is a part which discusses about subsequent measurement, all right? So measurement after recognition. And then you have some um, subsequent measurement, and then we have the recognition. So I also want you guys to go to IA 16, all right? On your other book, all right? IAS 16, all right? Possibly paragraph, um, I want you to go to paragraph 31. Remember we are told that Land should be measured at um, evaluation. No, I want us to go there. Well, why am I taking you there? Remember this property, it was actually sitting as property plant and equipment before we moved to, to non-current assets hold for sale. So in regards to this now, you right, we can see now property A is actually land. And here on the accounting policies, all right, we can see here, uh, they're telling us that land, all right, uh, including land on which the factory building has been built, is classified as a separate class of property plant and equipment. Land is not depreciated. Devaluation and then um, property plant and equipment according accounted for according to the cost model, except for land, which is accounted for in accordance with revaluation model in terms of A16. Revaluation samples are transferred to returned earnings when the land is disposed of. All right, so in terms of this, that is the company's policy. So initially, all right, let's first discuss what is happening um, in terms of this. Let's go to paragraph 31 of I-16. All right, so in terms of property A. All right, so property A, do you see paragraph 31? It says, after recognition, an asset and item of property plan and equipment whose family can be measured reliably shall be carried at a revalued amount, being its fair value at the date of the revaluation, less any subsequent accumulated depreciation and subsequent accumulated impairment loss. Revaluation shall be made with sufficient regret to ensure that the carrying amount does not differ materially from, from all the assembly. All right, so in terms of this, all right, this is land. We are told now land, um, they're not revaluing, they're not depreciating land, I mean to say. So we will start off right, by saying the land or property A, property A is owner-occupied. Right? Property A is owner-occupied. Right, making it so initially. I know there will be no mark for this because the one subsequent measurement initially it is classified as property plant and equipment. All right, subsequently, the land or property A is measured at revaluation model, right? So subsequently, the property is measured at revaluation model, right? And then, 
So in regards to this now, let's look at, at year end. All right, so at year end, what is the revaluation of, uh, of this property? All right, when I need to, to pay attention in this regard. So at year end is 30 June, all right? So on 30 June, see, uh, property A is revalued. You. So in this case, it is revalued to this amount, which is four million per hundred. Right, it is revalued to four million per hundred. Then you start. Now, what happens now in regards to this? There's no revaluation movement, right? In this case, from 30 June 2022 to 30 June 2023. There is no revaluation set, as you guys can see. Right, so in this case, you can start. There is no Revaluation surplus on 3 June 2023 as the revaluation amount is the same as revaluation amount on 30 June 2022. So in terms of PPE, that is what we have with regards to with regards to to our land. All right, you can see four point five. It is still the same as the selling price in this regard. Right. So that is what we have in terms of this. Since the property is being disposed, right? As you guys saw, they're telling you now that the property now is actually being disposed. All right. The property is disposed, all right? Which means, which imply revaluation surplus amounts, all right? In terms of this, here's the part that you are. Remember the counting policy. Revaluation surpluses are transferred to retained earnings when the land is disposed. Right? So in this case, you write down, which imply revaluation surplus amounts are transferred to retained earnings as follows. All right. So, in regards to this, we are saying the revaluation surplus amounts, we are going to move them to, to retained earnings. So, we now want to determine now <clears throat> how much is sitting on the revaluation surplus account. I don't know if you guys are still with me in this regard. Everyone's still here? Yes. Yes, yes, yes. Yeah. Perfect. Now let's see yes, how much. Yes. All right, perfect. Let's see how much we have in the revaluation surplus account. Now, we bought the property now on 1st of June, or 1st of January 2017 for 4.4. .4, all right. And then on 30 June 2018, the value went up to 4.8. All right, so let's do the calculation. Evaluation surplus 2018. So in 2018, our revaluation surplus amount, so it was revaluation amount, so it's 4.8, right? And then cost, we said it's 4.4, right? So in this regard, it gives us a difference of how much? 400,000, right? And then after tax, or you can say tax on revaluation. So it will be 4.4 times, remember it's blend, 80% times, what was our tax rate in the exam? So the tax rate, I believe it was 27%. Boom, 27%, right? So times 27%. So why are we doing this calculation? We now want to calculate the amount that is moved to retained earnings. Remember we are told now that um, when we sell the asset, so all the amounts that are sitting in the revolution surplus account, 
they are moved to retained earnings. So we have revaluation surplus. So this is the amount that was sitting in the revaluation surplus account in 23 June 2018. Right, then we come to 2019. What transpired in 2019? <clears throat> So in 29, oh, sorry, not 2019, 2021, right? So in 2021, we have revaluation of 4.2. It's actually a loss, all right? So revaluation, loss, all right? So um, it's a deficit. So in regards to this now, um, this is a part now that you have to pay attention, right, with regards to, to the deficit. All right. So in terms of the deficit now, all right, the difference between new revaluation amount, new revaluation amount and cost is transferred to Profit and loss. All right. So the difference between the revaluation deficit and the cost is transferred to profit and loss. Then the difference between cost and then this regards the difference between the Revaluation deficit, all right? So in this case, we use 4.2 and the cost, all right? It goes to statement of profit and loss, all right? And then, um, so in other words, there's, there's a deficit there. And then the excess, all right, from this revaluation surplus. Um, so 4.8, you know, so 4.8 minus this 4.2, it goes to statement of um, revaluation surplus. Right. So in this case, let's just draw a timeline so that I can just show what I'm explaining here. So this is us. Right. This is what we have. Right. So cost is here, all right? Anything else below cost? Yeah, that, all right? Amounts above the cost? Goes to OCI, which is your devaluation. Right, so in terms of this, let's quickly see now with regards to this, what is happening. So we said our cost is 4.4. That is the cost price. So the cost is 4.4. Right? And then the new revaluation is 4.2. Right? And then we are coming from what? 4,800, isn't it? That is where we are coming from, right? We are coming from 4,800 to 4.2. So what we were going to do now is the difference between 4.4 and 4.2 is recorded in profit and loss. And then the difference between 4.8 and 4.4 is recorded in, um, in other comprehensive income. All right, so yeah, so the difference between cost and um, revaluation above cost. All right, is recorded in OCI. All right, so that is what's happening. So our impairment loss, this one, the difference between cost and um, new revaluation is going to profit and loss. So which means it's already sitting in the retained earnings. We don't worry about that. So the only difference that we're concerned about is this one, all right, which is the difference between um, the revaluation and the cost. So in this case, we have 400 again. So in other words, 
uh, we're going to have in 2021, we are going to have revaluation deficit, all right, which is going to be, it's still going to be the same because both will take us to, to uh, 400,000. So we have, um, it will be sitting at this. So which means in the revaluation account, we are now sitting at zero, all right? So in 20, 2021, we have nothing in the revaluation account. I don't know if you guys are still with me there. No, please explain again. All right. Let me see where it's written. Uh, 16. And the revaluation. Can you go to paragraph 14? Are you 16? Paragraph 14. What? Paragraph 14. Are you guys there? Yes. All right. Others yes. are you there? All right, cool. So it says if an asset carrying amount is decreased as a result of revaluation. So the carrying amount, so in this case, we are looking here, the asset's carrying amount is decreased as a result of revaluation. Do you see? The asset's carrying amount is coming to 4.2. The decrease shall be recognized in profit and loss. However, the decrease shall be recorded in other comprehensive income to the extent of any credit balance existing in the revaluation surplus in respect of the asset. So in other words, what are they saying? So we previously raised a revaluation of um, 313600. That is the revaluation that we recorded. Now, there was a decrease on the revaluation. All right. Um, now, our revaluation now, surplus account is sitting at 313. All right. That is what we have in the revaluation surplus. But it went down more than 313. So that is what they're saying. The excess amount shall be recorded in profit and loss. In simple terms, what is what does it mean? It means cost is your peg. This is your limit, the 4.4. Remember, this is your original cost. So initially, you recorded revaluation, right? Surplus from 4.8 to 4. Uh, sorry, from 4.4 to 4.8. This is what you created in your reserve, revaluation reserve. Then in the following few years, there was an impairment which exceeded actually more than your cost. It went down as far as 4.2. So we're saying the 4.8 and the 4.2, the difference is what you have in your revaluation surplus, right? This is what you have in your revaluation surplus. And then here it went way below that, which means the difference now between 4.4 and 4.2 is recorded in the statement of profit and loss. Still lost. No, I got it. Thanks. All right. And others are we coming around? So in other words, we're saying, how much do we have in the revaluation surplus? We're sitting with three, three, one, three, six hundred. But now, if we take 4.8 minus 4.2, do you see it's now more than the amount we already have? So we limit this amount to what we have in the revaluation surplus. Okay. Cool guys. So that's basically how we go about it in terms of in terms of evaluations. So if we're fine with this one, uh, that is uh, that is okay. All right. And then um the next part, all right. Um the next part now we're coming from 4.2 to 4.5. So our asset now is now valued to uh, 4.2. Now it's moving to 4.5. So they, there is also another revaluation 
right, which is taking place. So on, um, so in this regard, all right, in this case, uh, there's excess revaluation. So which year is it? 30 June, 2022. All right, so in 30 June, 2022, there's revaluation. So in this case, revaluation amount is now sitting at 4.5. All right, and then prior revaluation or 200. Right, then what do we have in the revaluation surplus? So, in the revaluation surplus, we have 300,000. Then, after tax, so tax, so it'll be 300,000 times 80 percent times 27 percent. So, which means now. So in this case, in the revaluation surplus, now we are sitting with this balance. So this is the amount that we are sitting with in the revaluation surplus. So this amount is the one now that they are telling, saying you move to retained earnings. So let's quickly look at it, all right, on our discussion. So you show this calculation, all right? Remember, there will be a max. So you have to state, all right, the balance of 235,200 in the revaluation surplus account is transferred to retained earnings on the disposal of the property, all right? So in this regard, we're disposing the property. So which means this value now is transferred to, to retain earnings. All right, so that's subsequent measurement. I don't know if there's any question before we move to, to direct operation. All right, and then we move on to derecognition. All right, you go to paragraph 67. Right, from a if phrase, I 60, paragraph 67. What does it say? It says the carrying amount of an item of property planted equipment shall be derecognized on disposal or when no future economic benefits are expected from its use. All right, so you start on 30 June 2020. Three. Ian. Yes, ma'am. Sorry, it's about. I just got one question. Mm. On the previous one, uh, the reason why we took uh the two three five two hundred to return any is because there was no change in the twenty twenty three revaluation amount. Correct. Yes. So, so in this case, this is the only balance that is left in the revaluation surplus. Remember, okay. when the asset is sold. Right when the asset is being disposed, all the balances, which are all the amounts that are sitting in the revaluation surplus account, we move them to retained earnings. Okay, so if the 30 June 2023, if the amount there was let's say 4.7, would we still have to calculate the revaluation surplus and use that amount? So, so if, if on 30 June 2027, there was or 2023, there was 4.7, so we're going to yes. check. So in this case, we're going to take 4.7 minus 4.5. It gives us 200,000. Then we deduct the tax, right? So we're going to okay. take that revaluation plus this. Remember, this will be the total amount that you have in your revaluation surplus. Okay, so we take the accumulated re revaluation yes, surplus. Yes. yes, so but the accumulated... Why didn't, we, hmm. why didn't we take the three point, uh, the one in 2018 into account? Which one is the three one three? The three one three uh, six hundred.
You mean this one? Yes. No, but remember with this one, they had a gain in 2020. Uh, in 20, 20, yeah, 20, in 2021, or 2018, there was a gain, right? Yes. Of 31,360. Then in 2021, yes. there was a loss of 31,360. So which means these ones, they canceled each other. That's why we didn't take it. Uh, okay, thank you. Thank you. Understood. Thank you okay. very much. Okay. So on 30 June 2023, so we then have to write, all right? Um, on 30 June 2023, um, Hanijo. You de recognize. So de recognize the um, property A. Right. So in this case, what is the carrying amount? Four million five hundred. They will recognize carry property A at four million five hundred. All right. Um, upon disposal. All right. So that's what we have in regards to this information. I don't know if there's any question in terms of this. So uh, with respect to this question now, um, they do not really want us to discuss about IFRS 5, non-current assets held for sale. Why? Because if you look at it, right, due to nearby lifestyle estate development, you decided to sell property A and acquire farmland. So in terms of this, right, they did not give us enough information to state that the property was to be classified as part of IFRS 5, non-current assets held for sale. Remember, in terms of IFRS 5, for an item to be classified under IFRS 5, one, the sale should be expected to be completed within 12 months. And then we also, um, management, right? The right for management should be um, supporting the idea to sell. Let me just quickly look for that. Dot paragraph talks about this file classification as held itself. Um, Right, so if you go to paragraph paragraph six, you know, that's where um it is true. We have the, the listings, you know, in regards to an asset to be classified as well. You know? So entities are classified in American as a for self. The carrying amount will be recovered principally through sale rather than through continuing use. For this to be the case, the asset must be available for immediate sale in its present condition. For the sell to be highly probable, a proper level of management must be committed to plan to sell. So in this case, as you can see, one, in terms of this question, they did not give us enough information to state that the asset was actually supposed to be classified as part of IFRS 5. Hence, we did not move to IFRS 5. We kept it as property plan and equipment. All right. Oh, guys. So that is what was expected of us in terms of that first part. So if they bring something like that, I believe you guys will be able to crack it now, right? Yes. Yes. Perfect. And then Beat says, disclose the property plan and equipment not to the financial statement of Honey Jew Limited for the year ended 30 June relating to owned assets only in accordance with IS 16. Paragraph 73D. All right, so part B. Property plant 
indicated. Right. I don't know how you guys performed here, right? But I believe um it shouldn't be much difficult as long as you're able to identify the items for any part of property plan and equipment. All right. So so the first thing, all right, so we have a CGU. That's a cash generating unit. All right. CGU stands for cash generating unit. All right. So this is what we have. We have property A and then we have property B. Let's see what is happening. Honeydew is a factory building near Krabo, where its honey is bottled on 1st of July 2018. At the initial recognition of property B, the land on which the factory is built at a cost of 1700000 And the factory building itself had a cost of 2400000 after initial measurement, Honeydew performed revaluation on the following debts. So these are the revaluation that took place right, on this debt. And then, so this property, can you guys see? I'm sure everybody can see that this property is actually used by Honeydew. So under property planned and equipment, the simple rule, right? These items... are used to buy the owner. So in order for us to classify an asset as part of property plan and equipment, it should be used by the owner. All right, so you do your framework, carrying amount, cost at, sorry, um, accumulated depreciation. All right, and then you have additions, Evaluation. And then you have disposal. Well, let me first put depreciation. Depreciation. And then you have disposal. Cost. Accumulated depreciation. And then you have at the end, you have carrying amount. Getting amount at year end. Cost, then accumulated. All right, so let's quickly see. Then we list down the components that we have there. All right, so I'm just going to make use of. So we have land. Right, then we have some buildings. Right, so that's what we have so far. So in terms of the land, so you can see, I prefer starting off with land. It makes life a little bit easier. So we have land that is coming from property B, right? I don't think there's anything in regards to this that has land, right? So we have uh, that skin care and all that, right? So we have land. All right, let's look at the land. So we've learned from property A. On 30 June 2022, it was valued at what? 4.5. All right. And then we've learned on property B. On 30 June 2022, it is valued at 1.6. All right, so what do we do? So we have learned. So cost. So alternatively, you could have done it like this. All right, show you working. Then you open your bracket like this, I1. You don't need to write cost. Just open your amounts. All right, in regards to this, you show the examiner that you added 1.6. This is in the exam. I know sometimes when I'm presenting things, I could have written land, cost, and all that, but just showing you techniques to save time. So you have 1.6 plus 4.5, all right? So these are the carrying amounts that you have at the beginning of the year. Right. And then you do your total. You're sitting at six million one hundred. So you record six million. So what did the examiner do? There? The examiner will come. So it's here six one hundred. So they'll come and say, okay. So they showed me point one. Let me go and see where the six one hundred came from. Then they see you working. All right. We don't depreciate land, which means the carrying amount will be 6,100 as well. 
And then revaluation, the first property, there is no revaluation. The second property, you need to do revaluation. So let's do working two. All right, so you do working two. What is happening under working two? So your property here, all right, you open your bracket so you can see it was 1.6, now it's 1.9. So you take 1.9, Minus 1,600. So it gives you 300,000. So you record this under revaluation. All right. So under revaluation surplus, 300,000. Show the examiner that you did the working under two. They'll come and say, oh, okay. So this is where they got it, the 300,000. All right. And then after that, there was a property that was disposed, which is the first property. So disposal. And then the first property, you removed now the value of the first property, right? which is that 4.5. Remember, this property was sold. So you minus it, 4 million per hundred. All right? So you have minus 500. All right, so you're taking off this amount. So you move it. All right? And then the carrying amount at year end is going to be what? So the cost, so the cost of your property now is going to be, so you take carrying amount at beginning plus the evaluation minus the property that's been sold. So it will take you to 1.9. 1.9, you can see this is the value of the other property. All right, so you have 1.9. And then um, here you also have 900. Right. There's no depreciation, so it will be zero there. Right, so you're going to see. Do you see land is a little bit easier to work with, right? Which I believe uh, it will generate us um, more marks in this regard. Any questions, guys? All right, cool. So now let's proceed to the next part so that we can see now what is happening in this regard. So we're done with the land. Let's move on to the factory building. All right. At initial recognition, all right, uh, the useful life of the factory building was estimated at 30 years. It was determined that at the end of the useful life, the building could be sold at 850. What is that? This is your residual value. Yet initial recognition will also determine that factory building similar in size and function that we already at the end of their useful life. We're selling for 900,000. But what is that? It's a residual value as well. You know? So let's see. The factory building required a health and safety inspection every two years on 30 June. The inspection cost was erroneously expensed and amounted to, to the following. So these are the inspection cost that you are expecting. Right. Now, there's a component approach. There's a few things that you have to pay attention to with regards to the factory building. All right. So the first thing uh, that you guys were supposed to pay attention to was with regards to um was with regards to residual value. Now, do you see there's two residual value amounts which they gave you, right? You're not sure which one to use, unless if probably you read it through sample. You're not sure. What do you do? Open your if list, all right? Go to your A16. Okay. You go to A16 on your book under residual value, all right? That's where Everything, the beauty of the funding is everything is explained. So the examiner, the one to trust if you guys read your books or not. All right, let's quickly now go where there is a uh, discuss about residual value. <clears throat> right, what makes up residual value? There's depreciation. Um, this is what we have. 
Morat. Just look at the correct part. What we have to touch about um, residual part. It's like here yeah, under paragraph under depreciable amount and depreciation method. Right? Um, they did touch a little bit on residual value. All right. So whereby they said. Now let's look under the definition, okay? Let's look at, can you guys go to paragraph six where they talk about definitions? I think that's where they explained a bit about residual value. So there's a definition which says, all right? Um, it says residual value referred to paragraph 51 to 54 of an asset is the estimated amount that an entity would currently obtain from disposal of the asset after deducting the estimated cost of disposal if the asset were already of the age in the condition expected at the end of its useful life. Do you see that? Yes, I see it. All right. So in terms of this, what is going on with regards to this? So in terms of this residual value, they are telling us now that this is the amount you know, that the entity would currently obtain from disposal of the asset. Now, how much can we obtain if we dispose this asset? 900. So um, there is 900. And then there is 850. And it was determined that at the end of its life, the building could be sold it. For 850. But now we are referring to now. So, which means we're going to use 900, not 850. Why are we removing the 850? It is because now, remember, our definition is saying if we decide to dispose of the asset, assuming it is already at the edge, all right, and in the condition expected at the end of its useful life. So, in other words, the fact that others are selling at 900. That's the price that we're going to use. I don't know if, I'm, if it's making sense or I lost some of you guys. So those are some of the, the things that you need to pay attention to in the exam. They, they bring in questions like this to test you guys. Do you guys know your IFRIS book? All right. So accounting is difficult to pass if you don't make IFRIS your friend. You need to be able to see where am I getting what? In my book. All right. Anyways, um, that's fine. So that's what we have, all right, with regards to the to the factory building. All right, and then what is the cost of the factory building? All right. So the factory building, um let's see, possibly the cost is here. So do you see the initial record property bid, the land needed for it at a cost of 1.7. And the factory building it itself at a cost of two four hundred. So the cost of the building is two million four hundred. Right. So you now know the residual value. You now know the cost. You are good. Now the next step with regards to this is on inspection. All right. So now in terms of this, you have a challenge. Your building now is supposed to go through health and safety inspection every two years. So when you determine, remember the building is acquired on 1st of July, 2018, all right? And then the health and safety, uh, the building requires health and safety inspection every two years on 30 June, all right? So on the first part, the inspection or cost was erroneously expensed and amounted to the following. 
So, which means this factory cost were never included in the 1.7. Remember, they were erroneously expensed. So, which means we never included in the in the value of the building. So, the first thing, let's do the calculation of building. So, cost of the building. What is the cost of the building in this case? So, the cost of the building, we can see it cost 1.7. Right, that is the cost of the building that we have. So we have 1.7. So we have 1 million seven hundred. Right, that is our cost. And then now we now want to determine now in this regard what is the depreciation and all that regards to right. So depreciation, right? You could work depreciation on building. Right, what is going to be the depreciation of the building? So it's 1.7 minus 900,000 divided by 30. All right. Remember, you bought your building now in 2018. All right, 1st of July 2018. Then, oh, sorry, not. Yeah, 1st of July, 2018. It's 2.4, not, not 1.7, it's 2.4. So the cost of the building is sitting at 2.4. Minus 9, 900 by that 10. Let's just quickly check. Remember they gave us accounting policy. If they're depreciating building using straight line, yes. Factory building and machine are depreciated according to straight line method. So that's fine. You need to cross check that as well. So, you use the building for this, all right? And then the current year is 30 June, 2023. Straight line method, it means the same amount of depreciation of and over, right? So which means now for the building, you could have just second to 400 minus 900 divided by 30 times. How many years now, all right? So in regards to this, we need to, to include the number of years now that comes with, with the building. So the building, um, we used it 2019, 2020, 2021, 22, right? So that's four years, 19, 20, 21, 22. So that would be four years. So multiply by four. I don't know if you guys can see where we are in this regard. So this is accumulated depreciation on the building. Then we look at inspection. Right? What is the accumulated depreciation that comes with the inspection? Right. So in terms of this, the inspection from the previous year so we have an inspection now, which is taking place in 2021. We need to add it to the cost of the building. Remember this inspection in 2019, we add it to the cost of the building and then we remove it, all right, to recognize it. So it means this inspection of 34,000, we need to add it to the cost of the building. So under cost of the building, we also need to add Cost of the building is 2,400. We need to add 34,000. Right, let me just quickly show it. Maybe it's six or five. All right, why are we including it? Just gonna show you just now. Right, remember the cost will be made up of purchase price plus the cost of the inspection. So in terms of this, this inspection of 26,000, if we're in 2019, we're going to add to the 2,400. But now, since there's a new inspection in 2021, which means this other inspection is fully depreciated, we remove it from our records. All right, the same applies with this inspection of 34,000. We need to depreciate it. So it was in 2021. So we depreciate it in 2022. So we provide for depreciation for that part as well. All right, so we're going to do depreciation 
for this. 34,000 divided by two. Remember, inspection is taking place every two years. So in this regard, we have 34,000 divided by two. So which will give us 1.7. That means now, total depreciation, all right? Total accumulated, just to guide you guys, depreciation. It's going to be 1,700, also 17,000, which is depreciation on inspection, plus 200,000, which is depreciation on, on the building and so on. I don't know if you if I lost some of you guys or we're still on the same page. So do you take us to 270? Are you guys still with me or I lost some part of you guys? Still good. Still with you. And please just move the calculation from the from the land uh, column. I think that the 20,000 or 200,000 at the bottom. At the bottom. Let's see. The 200,000. Uh, which one is that? That. This one. 200,000 and the next ones, you put them under the land column. Oh, you mean you mean this calculate the 1,700 yes. plus 200? Yeah. No, but remember, yes. there's a gap here, no? So these are workings here. So the PPE oh, okay, note okay. is ending here, yes. So PPE note is ending here. Okay. All right, perfect. So we have it sitting like that. And then there was no revaluation on land, of course, we're carrying it at cost. And then current year, all right? 2022, 23, I mean, what is our depreciation for the current year? All right, depreciation for the current year. So we're going to take the building is two four hundred minus nine hundred thousand divided by thirty, right? Plus plus what? Plus um the thirty four thousand divided by two. So this is what will give us our total depreciation for the year. Oh, alternatively, one could have done it separately. Still fine. Right, let's just do separately to avoid confusing you guys. So we have this part. So this is land on its own without the, the inspection. And then this is depreciation of, of the inspection. So it will be 34,000 by two. Remember, inspection is taking place every two years. So it will take us to 17. Then total depreciation. In this regard, so you then add 117,000 plus 50,000. This is all right. So in this case, 17 plus 50,000. They then take us to 67,000. So our depreciation for the year, we have it as minus 67. Then under disposal, we need to remove, we now need to remove this inspection of 34,000. So you're going to take minus 34,000. What is the accumulated depreciation that came with, with this? So the accumulated depreciation is also 34,000. So in other words, now, the value of this is now zero. I don't know if I'm making sense in this regard. Remember, it is fully depreciated at year end. Remember, we at disposal we recorded carrying amount. Right? So what is the carrying amount of this um, inspection? It's zero. Right. That would mean at year end, what are we going to do now? So the cost. All right, the cost of the asset is going to be the cost at the beginning minus the cost of the derecognized item there. So you're going to remain with 2400. Then accumulated depreciation. So we're going to do accumulated depreciation at the beginning. All right, which is going to be T. 
two, this one, plus this depreciation, and then minus the accumulated depreciation of the asset that has been disposed, that has been derecognized, I mean. And then the net amount will be our carry amount at the end. All right, so that is what was expected in terms of in terms of the land. Any questions? Yeah, Ian, you make it look so easy. How do we understand it now? Come exams, what happens? <laughs> um, I do get a point. Sometimes in the exam, uh, the situation is a little bit different to to now. Remember, everyone is relaxed right now. Uh, that's why sometimes it's recommended that we we work on work on questions under under exam conditions. You know what? Okay, cool. So let's look at the next asset and see what is happening there. All right. So in terms of the next asset, um, what do we have? So you're gonna have um oh we're still looking at the other asset. So we're done with the building. Um we now move on to property C. All right. So I need you acquired the vacant land in the Elmer Valley on first of May 2023 at an amount of 5.3. Transfer duties six hundred were paid and legal fees related to the transaction amounting to this. Right. They acquired a vacant land. All right. So in terms of this, actually we forgot to add this. Huh? This is another land as well. It was bought on first of May, so we need to include it as well on part of the land. So let's include it. Sorry about that. So I need to include it as part of the land. Right, so what is the cost of this new land? Remember they're acquiring it so that they can start operations there. So 5,300 plus <clears throat> legal fees and transfer duties, 600 plus 13,400 legal fees. Right, so it then give us our total there. So our total is that. We need to add it as well under additions for the land. Six. Right, so which means the carrying amount of the land at year end, the cost is going to, to go up. So you have to add that, and then this one has to comply. So that's the amendment for the, for the land. All right, remember this property is where we are going to, to acquire your property, All right? But if this acquisition of property C, if they did not have any purposes yet for that property, it was going to be classified as investment property. But we know at the top there, right? ML, um, I think they mentioned somewhere there that we're going to, to build another property. After disposing this property, do you see? Instead, I need to decide to sell property A and acquire farmland in the ML. So in this case, um, 
uh, but still build, right? They were planning to build, so which means they're going, the land is classified as property, plant, and equipment, right? Then we have machinery. Hanigi uses an automated bottle filling machine to fill different sizes and shapes of glass bottles with the honey retrieved from its beehives. The machine was acquired on 1st of April, 2019 at a cost of 1.2. At initial recognition, its life of the machine was estimated 10 years and the residual value was regarded as a material. Right, so that's what you have. And then, on 31 December 22, a significant component of X of the machine had to be replaced. And the initial component, component X was not identified as a separate component. With the replacement of component X, Hanigi was informed that the component might be replaced every four years. The initial record in Hanigi also invested 850,850 worth of spare parts relating to material parts of the machine to ensure continued production, including in the 858 is 25,000 worth of products such as oil and other consumer that is required for the day-to-day -to -day operations and maintenance of the machine. To date, the spare parts have only been utilized to replace component X. The initial cost of component X spare parts amounted to 400,000. Right, um, so let's look at machinery, which I believe You guys got it well, All right? So in terms of machinery now, what is going on? All right, so the first thing that we have with regards to our machinery now uh, is to look at what could be the possibly cost of the machinery, All right? So here, yeah, we can see now, uh, we're being told now that we bought a machinery for 1,200,000. Right? That is the cost of the machinery. The other part that you need to pay to attention to is, does the 1,200,000 include the significant component or not? Right. Um, so in terms of this, right, um, we're being told that when the significant component X of the machine had to be replaced, at initial recognition, component X was not identified as a separate component. What does it mean? It means the 1200 includes the component 400. Right. So that means the cost of a machinery initially, of course, there's no issues. It's 1200, right? including the significant component. It's 1200. The issue only comes in now when you want to split for depreciation with regards to machinery. So the reason why we now need to remove the cost of the component is our machinery is supposed to be depreciated over 10 years, but the component is depreciated over four years. Right, that's the first thing. The next thing is spare parts. These costs are not in Included from the cost of your assets. If you're not too sure, you open your ethics. All right, go to IS 16. Um, if you're not sure about the spare parts, you just go to IS 16, paragraph um, that includes elements of cost. All right, um, and now. So in terms of this, right? Um, well, let me just look at cost about the day-to-day -day operations, all right? Um, So there is, there is cost which are included on the value of your property plan and equipment. All right, remember, if you go to paragraph 17, they gave you a list of examples of directly attributable costs. These are the costs that you include in your PPE. So you have salaries of, of course, employees, all right? Cost of site preparation, initial delivery, and then installation and assembly cost of testing and professional fees. Then they give you some cost, right? Where they say they're not included, right? Um, in this regard. So in terms of this, under paragraph 20, 
All right. Um, or even under paragraph 19, they give you some costs that are excluded from the value of property plan. So cost of opening new facility, cost of introducing a new product, um, cost of conducting business in new location, all right, and then administration and other overhead cost. So in this case, the spare parts, all right, the spare parts as well as the costs that come in with day-to-day -day operations. These are costs that enable us to do the operations. They are not included. All right, remember property plant and equipment. These are assets that you're expecting to hold for more than one year. So which means now, in terms of this, in terms of um the costs now that you are involved in the day-to-day -day operation, you don't expect them to hold them in one year. All right, things like oil, we cannot depreciate oil. All right, these are day-to-day -day, uh, operating costs. So we do not include them on the value of our asset. All right, so you're not going to include that, all right? And then, uh, so we have 1, 200 divided by 10, all right? So uh, times, so in this regard, times what? When did we buy this asset? We bought it on 1st of April, 2019. So April, May, so April, April, May, June. So three months. So we used it for three months in 2019. So we can say time. Mm -hmm. Yeah. <laughs> Right. So <laughs> take us there, all right? So we have the first part. So it'll be sitting like this. So that is the depreciation for the first three months in 2019. And then uh, we need depreciation as well. All right. So we have 1, 200 minus 400 divided by 10 times so 2019 20 21 22 times three remember one accumulated depreciation right so it take us there and then um and then we have um 400,000 accumulated depreciation on the component. Divide by, so the component, we say the component we're expecting to use it for how long? It was expected for four years, all right? So the component was there from the beginning. So 400,000 divided by four times three out of four. Remember it was bought in April. So it takes us there, all right? Then the other one, 400,000 divided by four times three. Right, and then your total, total depreciation in this regard, you can have it as saying 300,000 plus 2,500 plus 2,400 plus 20,000, right? So you then give you the total accumulated depreciation in this case. I don't know if there's anyone who's lost so far. So 585. Five. Right, and then the carrying amount at the beginning will be the net of these amounts. All right, and then there was no additions, and then depreciation for the year. So in terms of depreciation for the year, you take depreciation for the component plus depreciation for the main asset. So the main asset, we say the cost is what? Um, 1,200 minus 400,000 divided by 10. So you take us there, all right? And then you have, and then you have, the other one is 400,000 
multiplying by 4. Take us to 100,000. So our total depreciation So detail us to one meter. All right, so depreciation for the current year, uh, you'll be sitting with one meter then. All right, and then your accumulated depreciation will be this plus the one meter. And then your cost didn't change, it's this. So that's how you could have gone about it. Any questions, guys? So that's the PPE not, and then you could have accumulated so many marks. All right? There was like 25 marks. Right? Which I believe you should have scooped. At least maybe if it comes again, you should get at least 20. Right out of those, I know there could be arithmetic or accuracies and all that, but just push to get all those marks. Questions, guys. Right, cool. Let's proceed to the next part so that we can see what's going on there. All right, so the next part, it says, discuss with the reasons whether all the costs that I need you incurred. But I can I give you a five minutes break? Just to breathe? Yes, please. All right, cool. <clears throat> All right, so the next part, it says, discuss with the reasons why the, all the costs that Honeydew Limited incurred relating to the product Honeycob can be recognized as an intangible asset in terms of IS3 intangible assets. All right, as of 30 June 2023. All right, so let's see. I believe you guys know now in terms of intangible assets. Remember, we have um, research cost, developing cost, and all that. So let's see. Let's go to Honeycob and see what is going on there. All right. So Honeydew is a qualified internal product development team with years of experience in the development of product that are made from honey. The product development department is situated near Torbech, which is also shared in the Western Cape Road. To date, the following products have been developed. So newly developed products during the 25th financial year, Honey June commenced with the research and developed various new hair care products as well as new skin care products, the two most promising new products as well. Honey care products. During the current financial year, Honey June commenced with the development of a hair cob, which is made from beeswax. The developer of the cob intended here to be nourished by nature's goodness with the, with each gentle slide of the cob through the combined uh, the combed hair. On 1st of October 2022, the development team did research on the viability of the idea and reported management of it on 14 October 22 that Bwax not only moisturizes hair but also helps to define curls and hold their form for a considerable amount of time. On 20 October 22, the development team continued their research by going to the market to confirm whether consumption would have an interest in the product. To their delight, consumers found significant value in the two-in-one products at the indicated estimated selling price. According to Honeyju, it's required profit margin. On 5, March, uh, 5 November 22, after receiving the response from the potential consumers, the management of an authorized the development team to commence with the development of the product. Management anticipated the product development to be completed by the end of 
2023 financial year and indicated their intention to commence with the production of the product early in the following financial year. On 10 November 22, Malay indicated that there are significant financial resources to acquire the technical and other resources required for the development of the product. Management also failed, uh, filed for the registration of the trademark name and the product, Honeycomb. In the company's and the Intellectual Property Commission, CIP, said the registration of the trademark was completed on the 20 July 2023. On 15 November 22, a specialist in the healthcare product industry was appointed to assist Honey Juice Forest product development team with the development of hair care products. The specialist confirmed the possibility of being successful with the development of comp and was eager to be part of um, the development thereof. GT Limited Space, the development team, shared floor space with other hair care product development teams, equipment, and raw material required with funds from the Honeycomb authorized budget were also used by other development teams for the development of their hair care products. The hair care product specialists assisted all hair care product development teams, and it was not possible to reliably allocate the time spent to each hair care product development. The Honeycomb development team was therefore unable to distinguish the cost of development of the product from other hair care product development cost. On 1st of April 2023, the project was delayed when the development team was challenged with determining the appropriate raw material combination, which would allow the comb to provide nourishment to hair without losing its form. The matter was resolved on 1st of June 2023, and the team announced that they are entering the last phase of the development, which is the finalization of the design of the comp itself. The design of the comp was finalized on 15 July 2023, and production of the comp commenced on 1st of August 2023. All right. Um, so in terms of this, skincare product, be beautiful. All right, so this is... Um, be beautiful is a skincare product range uh, reaching. Okay, let's see. All right, in terms of this, our question assume that the total cost, oh, actually, we're here. Discuss with reasons whether all the costs that Honey Dew incurred letting the product honeycomb can be recognized as an intangible asset in terms of ISA aid. All right. So this is um, the information that we have, all right, with regards to, to the honeycomb, right? So how do you guys know which cost, or what was your guide in this regard? Hmm? What is our guide, guys? You can see here, honeycomb. Right. This is the development that we have. What is your guide? How do you answer this question? Okay. So in terms of this here, to use IS38. All right. So that was a guide. Right, with respect to answering this question. Now, um, you can now go to, to IS38, right, from your first book, right? Remember the question says, discuss with the reason, or whether all the costs that honey you in kept letting the product honeycomb can be recognized as an intangible asset in terms of IS38 intangible asset. All right, so it was an issue now to answer this question, all right? It was important for you to understand which cost, all right, was supposed to be recognized as intangible assets and which cost was supposed not to be recognized as, as intangible asset. So we go now, all right, in terms of uh, IS3, all right, we go to paragraph um, cost of an internally generated intangible asset. So you go to paragraph now um, in this regard, you can go to paragraph 51, all right? You look at paragraph 51 to see now what is happening in that regard. 
I don't know if you guys are there. All right, so we're discussing about I straight cost. So the paragraph 15, we can try to start off with one. Cost of internally generated intangible set. All right, that's what we have in terms of this paragraph. All right. So um, internally generated um, then I generated intangible assets, all right? So in, in regards to this, all right, you can see under paragraph 51, it says this is sometimes difficult to assess whether intangible and intangible assets qualify recognition because of problems in identifying whether and when there's an identifiable asset that will generate expected future economic benefits and determine the cost of the asset reliably. So you can start off by quoting that paragraph, all right? Here's your starting point regards to this question. All right, so you can say um, it is sometimes difficult right, to assess whether an internally generated tangible Asset qualifies for recognition because so I'm quoting paragraph 51 identifying and identifying whether and when there is and identifiable asset that will generate expected future economic benefits. All right, and then, so that's the first part. And then determine the cost reliably. All right, so these are the parts uh, that we have, right, um, in regards to this. And then you say to assess whether, you quote paragraph 52, to assess whether an intelligent intangible asset meets the criteria for a good. And indeed, to classify the generation of the asset into, you know, to assess whether an internally Tangible asset meets the criteria, all right? Recognition an entity classifies the generation into research and development cost. All right, so the issue now, um, so and then you state paragraph 54, expenditure arising from research um, shall be recognized as expenditure. Right. Then you look at also development, all right? Intangible asset rising from development shall be right recognized as an intangible asset. Or you can say um, shall be recognized if and only if 
Right? An entity can demonstrate the following. Right, an entity can demonstrate the following. So we're looking at paragraph 57, All right? Technical feasibility. Right. It's intention. All right. Complete intangible asset. How the intangible how the intangible we generate um probable future economic benefits. All right, and then the availability of technical and financial and other resources. Availability of technical, financial, and other resources to complete the development. All right, and then its ability to measure reliably the expenditure attributable to intangible asset. All right, so what is going on in regards to this? So they are telling us now, when do we start the capitalization? of internally developed cost. All right, so it's important before you start answering the question, uh, like I said, it's important that you know your IFRIS book. All right, then here, yeah, so it's discussed with the reasons whether all the costs that Honey incurred relating to the product, Honey Corp, all right, um, can be recognized as an intangible asset in terms of ice the rate. All right, so let's quickly see in terms of these, these are the expenditures now that they incurred um, as a result of, of the honey cob. All right, so now we have listed down all right, what's happening in this regard, all right. And then now what is going on in regards to the, the first thing was for us, all right. Um, So in terms of this, we had to look now based on the information. Remember, there was a product now which they were developing, which they are calling hair product honeycomb. All right. Um, so in regards to this, all right, um, we now need to understand under which stage did they complete the research and the move to research to development, all right, in regards to the to the honeycomb. All right, so on 1st of October 22, the development team did research, all right, on the viability of the idea and reported management of it that BWAX not only moisturized hair, but also helps to define care and hold them, their form for a considerable amount of time. All right, so here, remember, they're doing some research, all right? So the cost incurred from 1st of October 2014. Until 14 of October, they're still going through the research. They are the research. And then on 20 October 22, the development team continued their research by going to the market to confirm whether the customer would have an interest in the product. So what is happening? Remember, in regards to this, for it to be development, what did we say? We said technical feasibility Intention to complete the intangible as or the intangible general probable future economic benefit, availability of technical financial and other resources, ability to measure reliably this cost. So when it we can approve all those points, that's when it becomes development. All right. And then after receiving the response of a potential consumer, the management of an authorized the development team to commence with the development of the product. All right. Management at this spread, the product will be completed by the end of. So here, this is 5th November 2022. 
Right. And then on 10 November, management indicated that there are sufficient financial resources to acquire technical and other resources required for the development of the project. Management also filed for the registration of the trademark name of the product, honey called by the company's CIPC. All right. Um, so in regards to this, right, if you go to paragraph um if you go to IS38, right, you can see all the criteria under IS38, they were actually they were met on this day when they registered the trade. Remember, we spoke and then we said you know, the criteria with regards to, to internally generated intangible assets. All these criteria now are being met. So first one, technical feasibility of completing the intangible asset. Do we have the resources? Yes, intention to complete, ability to use, how the intangible asset will generate proper future economic benefits. They did all that. The availability of technical, financial, and other resources to complete. So in regards to this, so we can see cost incurred on or after. All right. So in regards to this cost incurred on or after, on or after which date? On or after 10 November 2022. Should be capitalized as yes. intangible assets, all right? As this is when all the development criteria for intangible assets was met. All right, so in regards to this, um, so with all the development criteria was met, all right, you can see the appropriate level of management, all right, was in support of the idea. The intention to complete the intangible asset was to sell, all right. The intention as it was determined. Intention as to sell to consumers. All right. Technical feasibility. All right. As well as technical feasibility of these um, products. A specialist of the air product was appointed to assist Honeyju. All right. So in regards to this, you can see sufficient resources. Management indicated that they are sufficient. All right. So you write down management indicated that they are sufficient resources complete development of intangible asset, all right? And then also in this regard, um, the intangible asset was registered on CIPC CIPC, all right? Uh, in this regard, showing the company now that there is no going back, all right? And then you go back and check in terms of the question. Remember the question is saying, discuss with the reasons whether all the costs that Honey incurred relating to the product Honey Corp can be recognized as intangible assets. So let's see, in regards to this, the cost that we have about Honey Corp. Right, are these part skin products part of Honey Corp? They are, right? The, the two most high energy comments with the recent various new hair care products as well as new skin care products. All right, so this first one is honey cob. All right, so the cost that we have, um, these are the costs now that we have, or detailed um, hair care products. Honeyju was able to allocate the cost incurred as follows. So which cost were incurred? B, the skill products range in recent excedence with honey as the main ingredient. 
the cost relating to the development of this product was greater than the cost of developing relating to the other product developing during 2023. The B, beautiful products, development cost complied with all the criteria in terms of life status. Eight, intangible asset to be recognized as an internally generated intangible asset. Cost incurred for the financial year ending 30 June 2023. Honey, you was able to allocate the cost incurred as follows. Skin care products, be beautiful. Or hair care products. All right? So these are the products that relates to, to the hair care. Honeycomb, we saw here, honeycomb was also um, part of the hair care product, right? Hair care product, honeycomb. So I want to see in terms of this. So we have research cost, all right? These costs, we expense them, right? The research cost, we're supposed to, to expense them. All right, so you write down research cost, of, of how much? You know the question wants us to look at honeycomb only. Honeycomb is hair products, all right? So which is two fifty. Um, research cost of two hundred fifty thousand is expensed. As um, it is expensed. And then what else do we have? We have laboratory cost, which is sitting at one ten. All right, they just said laboratory cost and then they classified as general. Water and electricity, 85,000. And then we have labor cost, wages, that is associated with hair care product, 340. So you then start, right, in regards to labor cost. So the labor cost, which we incurred from, so labor cost, right, from, 10 November 2022 until year end should be. So when was the development? When did we end the development? Let's see. So in regards to this, the matter was resolved on 1st of June 2020 and the team announced that they are entering the last phase of the development, which is the finance of the design and the combo itself. And then the design of the combo was finalized on 15 June 23. And production of the combo commenced on 1st of August 2023. So we have cost and deal 31 July, right? So development ended on 31 July, right? 10 November until 31 July 2023 should be capitalized as development cost. Right, and then we do the same, right? And the other one, other direct cost, we include them as well. So other direct cost, other direct cost of 155,000 incurred from 10 November 22 until the 20th of July 2023 should be capitalized. That's different cost. All right. And then we have uh, the last one is general administration cost. General administration cost should not or should be. Should be expensed right so basically that is what we have with regards to to our cost in terms of this and then general cost of course we expense those ones then the next part uh they want us to look at the next part assume that the total cost in care relating to product honeycomb could not be capitalized as intangible as in terms of high state aid Disclose the not of intangible assets to the financial statement of Honey Jew Limited for the year ended 30 June 2023. So they want you to do the not. Right, so they want us to look at the not in respect to intangible asset. So what do you guys do? 
with regards to intangible asset. So it's quite important, you know, um, that we have an understanding, you know, that we first identify the intangible asset, all right? So, um, So let's quickly see which ones are our intangible asset. All right. So this is what we have. Cost incurred for the financial 30 June 2023. Honeyju was able to allocate the cost incurred as follows. So we have development cost, laboratory cost, general. I believe uh, with regards to this, um, that's what we have, all right? And then we have water and electricity, which is 85. Labor cost, which is that, other direct cost, and then general administration cost, which is sitting at, um, at that part of this regard, all right? So let's quickly look at this, all right? We have existing products as well. Po is a unique honey dispenser that allows the user to easily pour just the right amount of honey with a minimum effort at villages. The development of pour was finalized in June 2021. The development costs of pour compiled with all the criteria in terms of high rate to be recognized as a tangible asset. The amount of 7500 was correctly capitalized to the intangible asset at the end of 30 June 2021 financial way. Thereafter, capitalized commercial production of honey dispenser commenced. On 1st of July, the honey board director estimated that 1.5 units of whole products will be sold over the following five years. Honey sold 250,000 of poor units during the financial year ended 30 June 22 and 650 units during the financial year ended 30 June 2023. However, towards the end of 23, financial year. A competitor introduced a similar product to the market and Hanji had to lower the selling price of its poor products units to remain competitive. On 30 June 2023, it was estimated that the value in use of the intangible asset would equal to its fair value of 2 million one. Cost to sell the intangible asset is estimated to 1% of the fair value. All right. Um, so this one is a separate, it's a lease. So that's basically what we have, all right, uh, with regards to uh, to this part of the, the asset, all right. So let's look at it, all right, um, and see now what is going on in terms of in terms of uh, the other parts. So we can start off, all right. We could kick, kick start off now with. Um, we can start off with um, this product, poor product. All right, so we can start off with product poor. So we have different types of intangible assets. Right? So we can start off with poor. So we have carrying amount. Carrying amount, cost accumulated. Amortization. We just record it here. And then we have additions. Um, maybe additions. We have amortization. And then we have impairment loss and then we have maybe possibly disposal cost accumulated amortization and then we have cost accumulated amortization and then we have also we start off with carrying
hearing about it here. And all right, so basically this is uh what we have in regards to in regards to our asset. All right, so let's quickly look at it now, uh, so that we can see uh, what is going on there. All right. Now um Our asset, we are told now it was bought for, we bought it for 7 million 500, all right, in 2021. So let's see. So there was nothing that took place in 2021. So we have 7 500, that was the cost. Right, so that's that. And then accumulated um, amortization. So let's do workings. I'm just going to change to W now. So W1. So in terms of this, uh, let's go to the accounting policies. So being told now, in terms of accounting policies, an intangible asset accounted for according to the cost in terms of high estimate intangible asset. Amortization of intangible asset is calculated based on units sold as a percentage of total estimated units. So that is how we calculate the amortization. All right, so here, in terms of um, this product that we're dealing with, the cost is that. So in 2022, let's see how much was sold, right? Honey sold um, 250,000 units during the financial ended 30 June 22. Yeah, this is what they sold. So we're gonna take, 250 divided by the total, which is 1.5. So um, our amortization is going to be 250,000 divided by 1.5 times the cost, which is 7,500. There's no residual value in regards to this. I think they didn't mention anything all right, um, in terms of this. All right. They didn't give us anything about the, the intangible asset. In, Right, so we have, we do our calculation to get our accumulated amortization there. So accumulated amortization is 12.15. So we then record, so it's coming from the one 15 Right, then we net off these amounts. And then it take us there. So that's what we have with regards to the to this part. Then let's move on to the next part. All right. Um in regards to, to this part. So in terms of this, all right. Um so what do we have? So we are sitting now with, um, they sold, this is the sale that took place. And then towards the end of 23, financial competitor introduced a similar product to the market and the honey had to lower the selling price. So this is an indicator of, uh, of impairment loss. Right? So in regards to this, you can see the indicators of impairment loss, but let's calculate um, amortization for 2023. So we're gonna take 650, all right, um, divide by, 1.5. So working to W2. All right, so we have 615 to about 1.5 times 7. So that we know how much was the amortization for, for the current year. Right, so it's gonna take us to three three million two hundred and fifty thousand. So it will take us amortization for the current year, three million two hundred and fifty thousand. Right. But now the indicators of impairment. So we need to calculate now impairment. All right, W3. So let's determine carrying amount at year end. All right, I'm calculating the carrying amount before impairment. So we saw the cost 
was 7,500, right? So we can just take cost 7,500 minus 1,250,000 minus 3,250, all right? So this is what will give us the carrying amount before impairment. It take us to this amount. And then let's now calculate value in yours. So recoverable amount, I mean. Right, so recoverable amount, we say it is what? Recoverable amount is higher of value in yours. All right, so it goes to this. Um, in case somebody forgets where I am, let's just quickly go to the book, you know, so that we can see what's going on. So in terms of this, um, you could go to IS 36. That's the one that deals with um, impairment loss. You know, but I'm just going to quickly see what I have studied if there's anything about it. About impairment. All right, um, if you go to paragraph 119, all right, paragraph triple one, 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 under 11, and I studied, they talk about recoverability of the carrying amount of impairment. All right, so, but actually the appropriate um, standard to use is I right? So you could have used I studied, uh, which talks about impairment. All right, so in terms of I studied now, Paragraph, um, in this case, let's quickly go to paragraph. All right, let's start off with just look for the right for paragraph, which is about the measurement of impairment loss. Right. Right. So if you go to paragraph 59, you know, um, it says if and only if the recoverable amount of an asset is less than its carrying amount, the carrying amount of the asset shall be reduced to its recoverable amount. The reduction is an impairment loss. So this is I straight, you know, right? I S three paragraph. Uh, I S thirty six. I mean, um, so I S thirty eight. So in this case, we're talking about recoverable amount. Recoverable amount is explained under um, paragraph eighteen. You know, right? uh, I'm going to start off with paragraph twenty four. All right, recoverable amount of intangible asset. All right. So in regards to this that we have, right, higher off value news and fair value less cost to sell. So in this case, our value news, so we can see we're told, however, towards the end of um, the 2020 financial competitor introduced a similar products market and only due to lower the selling price, right? That's an indicator of impairment. On 30 June 2023, it was estimated that the value news of the intangible asset will be equal to the Fair value of 2100. So, which means value news is 2100. All right. And then fair value less cost to sell. All right. So, fair value less cost to sell is going to be 2100 minus. Remember, here we are being told now cost to sell of the intangible asset is estimated at 1% of the fair value. So, Cost to sales, 1%. So 1% 1 of 200. All right. So in this regard, that's how we could have the calculation there. So someone could have just said times 99%, still the same. All right. Or somebody could have said minus 1%.
So it take us there. So which means the higher of these two is two one hundred. Right. So we have two one hundred. You can see here the carrying amount is more than the recoverable amount, which means impairment. That's W. W five. Impairment loss. It's the difference between carrying amount, which is three million, minus the coverable amount, which is two one hundred. So it will take us to nine hundred thousand. All right. So in this case. 900,000 will be our impairment loss. We have accumulated amortization and impairment. All right, any questions, guys? And then the cost in change to minus that. The difference is what it give us, the carrying amount at the end. Patience, guys. Any questions, guys? None from me. All right, others? None. Okay. It's cool. And then let's see, remember in tangible assets now, they are not done, all right, in terms of this. So we have skincare products and hair care products as well. All right, so let's see what is happening. Cost incurred for the financial year ended 30 June 2023. All right. So let's quickly see now what is happening around skincare products. All right. Skincare products, that's an intangible asset as well. Right, so in regards to skincare products now. So we are looking at, um, in this regard, the research is this, right? And then the development costs are sitting at this, right? Um, so now let's see what is happening about the skincare product. Be beautiful, the skincare product range, which is antioxidants um, with honey as the main ingredient. The cost relating to the development of this product was greater than the cost of development relating to the other product development during 2023 financial year. The be beautiful product development cost compiled with the criteria in terms of aesthetics and tangible asset to be recognized internally developing tangible asset, right? Costing care. So with regards to this, um, in terms of this now, so this is what we have, right? In regards to skincare products. So we have labor and this. So we can just include them as part of additions, right? So these are the additions that just went through development. So we could have included it under additions, so you have all your total cost. So you have 462 dollars eight. That's eight. All right. So it gives us this total. All right. That's what we have in terms of the skincare product. So we're still um still going through development. So we don't amortize the skincare products. All right. So in this regard. There's no amortization, and then you just have your value there. This is carrying on to not disposal. Oh, we wrote it at the wrong point. But anyways, there are no disposal. We can also just delete this. 
Right, so we can just record it here as part of the cost. All right, and then we have it there because it's still going through the development. It was not completed. All right, and then we have OAK products, a detailed cost analysis to enable cost allocation. The individual OAK products group in this column was not possible. So you just have OAK products. All right. OAK products. All right, that's what we have. And then the cost of all hair care products. So we have 340, 55 and 55. So we're sitting with 340 plus 155 plus 55. Mm -hmm. Still the same, right? It was not completed. Oh, sorry, it forms part of additions. Right, it was not completed during the year, so no amortization as well. And then you have it sitting like that. So that is basically what was expected with regards to uh, to the intangible intangible asset. Any questions? No questions. All right, the other part. Um, so the other part now is with respect to, um, it says, prepare the journal entries to account for the lease agreement between Honeydew and Lease Me Limited in the financial records of Honey Limited. All right, so let's quickly see what is happening there. All right, so here's the information about the lease. All right, Honey Jew lease is one of his production machines from Lisme. So what does it mean? It's important that you pay attention in this regard. All right, um, Honey Jew now becomes the lease. All right, this is the lease, which means this tenant you are renting from the other guy. All right, and then lease me is the lessor. The machine is utilized the production of bottled raw honey. At inception of the lease, the lease machine was a new machine with the capacity to produce 1,440,000 units in total during its useful life. Both Honeydew and Lisme are registered for VAT purposes. Honeydew therefore utilize the machine in the production of taxable supplies. You may assume that the lease is not classified as an instrument credit agreement for taxation. On 15 October 22, Honeydew paid 20,000, know right? excluding VAT in lieu of fees to finalize the lease contract. On the same day, list me reimburse 10,000 of the legal fees payable to Anijo. The following information is contained within the lease. Commencement of the lease tenants, lease term. So the commencement of lease 1st of, Jan 1st of November 22, lease term 10 years. Annual lease payments payable in arrears 847,137.48. Residual value guaranteed. There's a question mark there. And then the lease machine has the capacity to produce 10,000 units per month. The number of units produced by the machine is internally recorded via the software installed under the machine according to the lease agreement. Honeydew may utilize the machine for the production of a maximum number of 9,500 units per month over the duration of the lease period. Honeydew guarantees that the machine will have the remaining capacity of producing a further 300,000 units when the machine is returned after the list, uh, the 10 lease period. If not, an amount of 150 per unit is payable for any unit produced in excess of the agreed upon criteria. Based on its current customer contracts, Honeydew determined at inception of the list that the machine will be utilized to produce 1,240 units in total during the 10-year 
period. Cash value of the machine at commencement of the lease, 5 million five hundred twenty thousand. How did you produce 80,000 units with the use of the lease machine during the period 1st of November until the June 2023? You may assume that the lease contains a lease in terms of if we 16 leases, and then that Hanji was informed that the interest rate implicit in the lease is nine percent. So basically, that is the question that we have with regards to to the lease. All right. So Hanji. Oh, sorry. So this is a lease. All right. Hanji is C. But in terms of this lease, Hanji is sitting in as as the lease C. All right. So which means now, um, Hanji now is a right of use, a right of use of set. Right. So step one, we both know. So step one, calculate implicit interest rate. Right. So luckily in the question, they gave you the implicit interest rate. It was given there, uh, which was sitting at um, 9%. The implicit rate, 9%. All right, so you have it. They gave me the question is 9%. Step two, present value of lease liability. All right, that is the next step. So yeah, um, so you present value of lease liability now. So you have an installment, which is the PMT that comes from the lease. So the installment from the lease was sitting at 847,137. 0.47. So you have it sitting like that. And then I, we have it as nine. And then N, the lease is for 10 years, right? Future value. It's guaranteed. So this is guaranteed residual value, right? So in terms of the lease, all right? Uh, let's quickly um, see now what is going on. All right. So in terms of this, um, let's quickly see, all right? Um, In terms of this, all right, um, so in terms of the future value, now, guaranteed residual value. Now, this is the part probably maybe that could have caught you guys in the, in the exam. Let's see now what is happening. The least machine has the capacity to produce 10,000 units per month. The number of units produced by the machine is internally recorded by the software installed under the machine. According to the lease agreement, Honeydew may utilize the machine for the production of a maximum number of 9,000 units per month over the duration of the lease. Honeydew guarantees, I guess that was the catch. So Honeydew guarantees that the machine would have the remaining capacity of producing a further 300,000 units when the machine is returned after 10 year lease period. If not, an amount of 1.5 per unit is payable for any unit producing excess of agreed upon criteria. Right. Based on his current customer contracts, Honeydew determined at inception of the lease that the machine would be utilized to produce 1,240,000 units in total during the 10 year period. So now, what was the catch? The catch in regards to this was, um, it was now a question now for you guys, right? Um, to be able to tell. So Anijiu is producing 440, right? So total units in regards to this, so total, expected total produced units according to Anijo. So it was 1240. All right, so Anijo is expecting to produce 1240. This is their estimation. But now 
Based on this agreement, the lease machine has the capacity to produce 10,000 units per month. All right? Um, so in regards to this, we are now saying 10,000 units. All right? Um, Honeydew may utilize the machine for the production of a maximum number of units, 9,500 per month over the duration of the lease period. So with respect to the agreement, all right? What was the agreement between these parties? So the agreement of these parties, remember they're saying, at the end of production, the machine should still have capacity to produce a further 300,000 units, all right? So, but now here's the challenge, all right? Honeydew is now expecting to use the machine for 1240 units in total during this period. But now let's quickly see with regards to what was the agreement. The lease machine has the capacity to produce 10,000 units per month. The number of units produced by the machine is internally recorded via the software in order. Honeydew may utilize the machine for the production of maximum number of 9,500 units per month over the duration of the lease period. So this is the agreement that they have. So 9,500, So there is 9,500 times 12 times 10. Let's see how much we have there. So it will take us to this. So do you see now Honeydew now is exceeding, right? Excess. So Honeydew is exceeding now the agreed upon units with 100. So, but now we are being told the excess, all right? So the agreement is to say, the machine should produce a further 300 units when the machine is retained after the 10 year lease. If not, an amount of 1.50 per unit is payable for any unit produced in excess of the agreed upon criteria. So here, do you see the agreement all right. The agreement was to say you should leave this machine with capacity to produce 300 units. But however, the machine now, all right, after 10 years, it is going to have capacity for 100 units. So the shortfall, all right, in regards to this, the shortfall now is going to be 300 minus 100. So there's 200 units that we now need to multiply now by 1.50 in order to come up now with the amount that honeydew has to pay with regards to to this um to this machine so it will take us to 300,000 so our future value will be sitting at 300,000 and then um we then compute um present value All right i don't know if you guys are able to work out how much you guys will get is the PV in regard to this. How much are you guys getting? Are you guys still there? You tired? Yes, I got the same yeah. one as yours. All right. Okay, cool. So we have um the present value. So right of use. So it will be present value of lease liability. So it will be this amount. All right, and then direct cost paid by lease. So how much did the lease pay? It's direct cost. So here we're told now 
that they paid. So yeah, Honeydew paid 20,000, excluding legal fees to finalize the lease. On the same day, um, lease may reinvest 10,000. So which means now legal cost will be 20,000 minus the 10,000 that was invested. So do you see that? 10,000, right? And then right of use of asset, you'll be seeing that at this value. So that's the amount that we then have as our right of use of asset. Right, so journals at the day that we ended the lease. So on 1st of November, 22. Right, so we record right of use of asset. SFP, so it is amount. And then we credit lease liability. So the lease liability is this amount, and then the balance will be paid. Right. And then on at year end, which is 30 June, so we can do a journal for interest. Right? So we have finance cost, which you guys can work there. And then we have this liability. All right, let's just quickly see when are we doing the payments. Annual lease payment of this. So we ended the lease on 1st of November, which means the payment took place on the 1 October 23, which is after year end. All right. And then, um, in terms of the right of use, so yeah, so Honeydew now produced 80,000 units. All right, in regards to this. Right, but anyways, can you guys quickly compute how much is our interest there? much do you guys get there's the interest alternatively if you feel confused you can just take nine percent times your lease liability is five five six three three six two times so it's november december january february march april may june times eight out of twelve all right if you guys assuming you guys were lazy to use the financial calculator so alternatively you could have done it like this You guys know how to calculate interest from your financial calculator. You go to amortization P11, P21, and then you get your balance. So it should be something like this. All right, and then you do another journal depreciation. P and L. Then you have your accumulated depreciation. All right, let's just quickly see in terms of the lease, what is the depreciation method they're using there? All right, and the policies. All right, we don't have anything about that, all right. Um, All right, so it looks like with regards to the lease, um, over the short of the lease term and useful life of the asset. So useful life of the asset, uh, in this regard, we can see now, our problem now is the useful life of the unit asset is given in units, and then we have lease term. So we're just gonna depreciate our asset over the useful life. All right, so we have 80,000 divided by 1214. All right. So five five seven three three six two times. So how many units are we expecting to produce during this period? Eighty thousand units. 
You're right? Divide by 1240. So that's what will give us our depreciation. You guys to our asset. And then you have it sitting like that. All right. Questions, guys, before you close. It looks like you guys are tired. Any questions, guys? No questions. From my side. And others? No questions. Okay. All right. Cool, guys. Hey, everyone. Hey. Uh, why are we multiplying by 18? By 18. Remember now, they produce here, we're told, and you produce 80,000 units with the use of the least machine during the period 1st of November 22 until 30 June 23. Oh, yeah. So we're okay. using it to calculate depreciation, yes. Oh, okay. Okay. Yes. All right. I understand. All right. Others, do you guys have questions? Thanks. All right, please. Okay, cool. If there are no questions, I can say happy studying, guys. Continue pushing, we'll definitely get there. All right, bye, guys. Bye. Thank you, bye. All right, bye.